Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, and we will be looking at verses 13 through 25. So again, Acts 13, 13 through 25, and we're going to continue our look at the first missionary journey there, uh, first missionary journey of Paul, uh, sometimes referred to. And tonight we're going to be looking at two things in particular. The first are a few lessons from John Mark, and then we're going to see the first portion of one of Paul's sermons. I don't know if you ever wondered what it would be like to hear Paul preach. Obviously, okay, we. I'm going to find out. You are. You're getting ready to. Mm-hmm. I sure am. <laughs> so tonight, what we're going to see is Paul's first sermon. Now we're not going to cover the whole thing, um, but what we'll look at in particular tonight is we'll see where Paul takes his sermon. And he preaches it, obviously, in a synagogue. We're going to see this. We actually get to see him do this. And the way he's going to do this is he's going to, in effect, show how God had a plan in history. And that plan was centered in Christ Jesus. And so he's going to those Jews and he's going to use the Old Testament for that. But later on, we'll we'll get to that. Uh, If you like to take notes... What we're going to look at is verse 13, first John, uh, a lesson from John Mark. Uh, in fact, it's a couple of lessons, but uh, two in particular. But uh, this is an important verse, and uh, you probably know, and you'll, if not, you'll find out very quickly, this is the abruptness of John Mark's departure. Okay, More on that in a few minutes. So that's verse 13, a lesson from John Mark. And then we're going to look at the mission continues, verses 14 through 15. And then finally, we'll look at the first part of Paul's sermon, and that's verses 16 through 25. And uh, that's a pretty helpful sermon, and I'll explain later, not only that you get to see, in other words, an idea of what his preaching would have been like, but it's going to give us an overview of the Old Testament, and more on that later. But uh, we're going to start on verse 13, so Connie is still on her journey so if somebody wants to read a really short verse tonight, verse 13 is the one. Anybody want to read that one, or else I will? Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Patmos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Okay, now I'm zeroing in on this. I'm sure we probably are at least are familiar perhaps, or at least maybe have heard before. And I kind of hinted at this when we first started the study here. But verse 13 is particularly important, and I'll tell you in just a few minutes, we're gonna, we'll see a few lessons we can learn from John Mark. But if so far, what we've covered in the missionary journey here, this is, of course, Paul's first one. He and Barnabas were serving at the church in Antioch, if you remember. They took a gift down to the church in Jerusalem. They came back. At which point, while they were serving the Lord, the Holy Spirit called them to go off on what we would think of as the first missionary journey. And they go and they set out on the missionary journey. And if you happen to have the Bible map that I gave you or your own, if you remember, they left Antioch and then they went from there to Seleucia, which is that seaport. And then they went to the island of, you remember the island Cyprus? Okay, and they make their way across Cyprus, but it doesn't take long, and they have opposition. You remember, Paul and and I, of course, just for simplicity, Paul, uh, rather than flipping back and forth, Paul, of course, was preaching there along with Barnabas, and they quickly have opposition. Of course, primarily because does Satan want the word being sent out? Does he want the gospel to go to and so forth? And we saw. Of course, no, but Paul overcame that by the power of the Holy Spirit, if you remember. And we had that Gentile believed. So just a brief reminder of what we saw. So the gospel, what we see early on in the first missionary journey, is that the gospel is spread, of course, via God's word, as we would think of it, but it's done through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is directing, is guiding, is leading, whatever you want to call it, He also is empowering, in that case, Paul, and then he uses the tool of the Word of God. We also saw that that's some of the provision that you and I need. There was the spiritual warfare act. 
aspect to it. You remember last week, you and I encounter spiritual warfare just like Paul does, or Paul did rather, and we overcome it with the resources we have, the Holy Spirit, prayer, God's Word, and so we looked at some of that. So they finished that, if you will, aspect of the first missionary journey. They finished the ministry there in Cyprus, and you'll notice when uh, Dave was reading of course, they make their way from Paphos, which is where they were. They're going to go to Perga, and which is in Pamphylia. Now, I'm going to talk about where that is in a minute, and we can see that on the map there, if you have it. Uh, they go up into what's called Perga. Perga is a seaport. But before we get to that, I want us to look at this piece because once they land there, and we'll get to what happens when they land and all that in a few minutes, John Mark leaves. Now, obviously, we don't know exactly what was the agent. In other words, what was the cause or cause is, what made him go back, we don't know. A couple of things we know about John Mark, if you remember, he had a godly mother, and in Acts 12, 12, uh, a lot of times the early church would gather there. He is Barnabas's, remember, cousin, Colossians 4, 10. That's important. Uh, and you'll see in a few minutes why I say that. I want you to turn, though, to Acts 15, just for a minute. Acts 15, verses 37 through 39. So they make it across Cyprus. They land there in Perga, which we're going to pick up with the story in just a second. But John Mark decides to go back to Jerusalem. We don't know the exact reason why, and I'll develop that in a minute. But what happens later is the first missionary journey concludes, and then Paul is going to be, if you will, I like to call provoked in his spirit, again, to go out on the second missionary journey. But notice um, verses 38, we'll just look at 37 through uh, 39, excuse me. So Barnabas, if you notice, and I'm just for simplicity, I'm just going to summarize it. Verse 37 of chapter 15 Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, remember he's departed, he went back to Jerusalem, and this is down in the, later on in time, but notice verse 38, Paul kept saying no because he had not completed the work that they were sent to do. Now again, we don't know what was the exact reason, there's a lot of conjecture is probably the best way to say it, but notice verse 39, and there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another, and Barnabas took Mark, and he went to Cyprus. So it's a similar trajectory as what the first one is, but notice verse 40. But Paul chose Silas, and he left, and he ended up going in a different direction. So I just want you to see that, just that you know. I'm sure you probably have heard that John, does, John Mark doesn't do that. But a couple of things to consider with this is, one of the interesting things is, years later... Paul and John Mark reconcile. Uh, I'll give you the verses for this. We won't turn there. Um, the, the main one, you can see this in Colossians 4.10, but where you really see it is in 2 Timothy 4.11. If you get a chance, again, that's Colossians 4.10, but in particular, 2 Timothy 4.11. And the reason why is because Paul there, and he is in what we've, that's his last letter that we have. After that, he's beheaded. He says that John Mark is useful to him. So if you just think about it on a linear line, the first missionary journey, the finished Cyprus, John Mark goes home. There is a very strong disagreement. There is a separation. But years later, they reconcile. And so it's really important to, do, to see that. We also know that John Mark went on to serve. And I think that's sometimes missed as well. He went and served with whom? Barnabas, right off. And the good thing, Barnabas was an encourager. Remember when we looked at that? He probably encouraged him along the way. He also wrote the Gospel of Mark. Mark. So what we see at this is that a couple of things, two things in particular. Uh, Charles Ryrie, um, you may have heard me use this quote before, uh, says that Mark's biography proves that one failure in life does not mean the end of usefulness. It's a good thing to remember. And I, I mention that a lot of times because we sometimes mess up when we serve the Lord, uh, and I'm not advocating that, but the Lord can still use us. Do you understand? Uh, 
I mean, if, if we messed up one time and we could never serve the Lord again, nobody would really be able to serve or your time would be short. So it's just worth noting that. And the, oh, yeah, I mean, and you see that, and you see that. You're right. You see that throughout the Scripture that there are times when even the Lord's servants have shortcomings. I'm not advocating that, but I'm just saying that the Lord could still use us, and we can be thankful for that. The other thing is, and I think this is often missed in the whole narrative of John Mark, is reconciliation. Brethren are supposed to be reconciled to one another, and... I like to say it this way to people. If you ever come to me, I'm going to tell you this. But you still, the only thing you can do is your best. You, you, you cannot resolve every conflict that is there. That is sometimes is a pastoral mistake because sometimes pastors put such a pressure. Well, you've got to go and reconcile. You may not be able to. I'll give you one passage, and then I want you to turn with me somewhere. Uh, in Matthew 5.24, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you need to stop what you're doing, and even before you come and you do anything, make an offering, go reconcile with your brother. And so we need to reconcile, but I want you to turn with me, and then we're going to move on back to this journey, but turn with me to Romans twelve eighteen, because uh, if you ever come to me, I will tell you, yes, you need to go, and you need to try to make things right with someone, but it's incorrect to say that in every situation that you'll be able to. So how do we kind of, for lack of a better word, how do you balance that tension out? We're supposed to go and do that, but what if it's not possible? I'm going to read Romans 12, 18. And actually, let's read 17 and 18. I think it just, just because of the flow of it. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. You notice what it says? What does that say? It says you need to do your part. You need to do what the Lord instructed you. But in some cases, unfortunately, you may not be able to. Do you understand what I'm saying? So there is sort of this idea sometimes where I know there is this push to reconcile, and that's true, but sometimes... The other party isn't willing to. There's a, a lot of different things. I only mention that to you because our role is to go and to do what we are able to do. You and I need to be open to reconciliation. Unfortunately, sometimes that doesn't happen. Do you understand? But we need to do our part and do our best. We need to be able to stand before the Lord and say, I tried with this person and I was open to doing it. But sometimes that's not always possible, is it? Especially if you get into unbelievers, it uh, can make it more tricky. So anyway, so what the Lord wants from us is to be faithful. That's what I oftentimes think of John Mark. He wants us to be faithful in whatever he's called us to do, not to so much be successful in the world's eyes. That, that's really what a servant of the Lord is supposed to be. He's supposed to be faithful to the Lord, 1 Corinthians 4.2. We also see, like I said with John, that... Uh, God still graciously will use us in spite of our shortcomings, but we need to do the best we can to reconcile and uh, hope and pray it works and just do the best we can. But let's move on. So uh, let's look at verses 14 through 15. So again, sidetrack there a little bit, but Acts 13, let's look at verses 14 through 15. Um, would someone want to read those for me? If not, I'll do it. Yep. All right, we'll stop there, um, and you'll see why I have it stopped there. So we see that the mission continues. So John Mark has gone back home to Jerusalem and all that I just mentioned. But what we're going to see here is you'll notice, and again, if you have a different map you're using, it's, it's still going to be the same. So they land in Perga. Perga is a coastal harbor city, so this will be similar to when they departed um, on the original trip. Uh, when they set off, and then they end up in, if you notice when um, Sue was reading it, typically translations will say Antioch of Pisidia or Pisidia Antioch, and the reason why is, think about it, where do they set off from? Antioch. Antioch. It's just to keep the two 
from being confused. You might equate it to, this is just me making this up, Charlotte, Michigan versus Charlotte, North Carolina. Do you understand? You might have the same, but then it's something to distinguish it. So that, that's why it's like that. But you'll notice they go to the same pattern. What's the pattern of Paul? Go to the synagogues because I told you last time is that that is by nature halfway there. And that's just my vernacular. The, the Jewish individuals in the synagogues, they already have the Word of God. They already have what we think of as the Old Testament. So he's already sort of halfway there. Uh, and you would think they would be open and receptive. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't, uh, which is a whole other story for another day. But uh, what you'll see there is that they go there on the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath for the Jews is what day of the week when we think? Right. So don't get confused with that. I really just want you to see one thing in those verses that Sue read. God's plan for Paul and Barnabas did not stop because of that problem with John Mark, did it? Paul was commissioned to go and to preach the gospel and take it to the Gentiles and... uh, Despite all the problems, the Lord was still going to work it out and work through that difficulty, and uh, he's still able to work through those difficulties because there's setbacks. Uh, Ministry, there are setbacks. Missionaries go. They have difficulties. But ultimately, who is the driving force behind the first missionary journey? It's not Paul. It's not Barnabas. It's not John Mark. It's one person. You might could say the Holy Spirit or the Lord, whichever way you want to say it. Okay, so I just want us to see that even though there was that difficulty, the Lord kept going. But we're going to go into the verses 16 through 25. I called it Paul's Sermon Part 1. There are three parts to this sermon, and it's a long sermon. And so it gives me justification on Sundays to go really long, because I figure it probably would have taken him a good 35, 45 minutes at least to cover this amount of ground, okay? No, but in all seriousness, this is for note takes taking. He's going to go to the local synagogue, but this is the first recorded sermon, so we can get an idea of what Paul does, how does Paul preach. What you'll find is there's no gimmicks, there's no shenanigans. He centers everything in Scripture, and the centerpiece of his message is Jesus Christ. Really shouldn't be that different now than, than what we do today. In other words, the, the text might be something, but Christ is always center. Uh, I'm going to give you this. This is Paul's sermon if it was an outline. You know, like on Sundays, I give you like the outlines. This is an outline of what the sermon is. Now, I don't think Paul had this probably in mind, and he probably would tell me, no, this is what I meant. But here is the way it's structured in Acts, because obviously it's not an audio. It's a summary here. It's in three parts, and you'll notice the structure of it. It's verses 16 through 25, which is we're going to look at tonight. That's part one. Part two is verses 26 through 37. So 16 through 25 is part one. Next week, we'll look at 26 through 37. That's the second part of the sermon. And then he concludes the sermon in verses 38 through 41. So three parts. We'll look at the first part this week, and then Lord willing, next week we'll look at the next two, and you'll see that. Now, when we look at this, I will just read it as we go through it, and uh, just I think it might make it a little simpler. But uh, let's start with just reading verses. I will read it 16 through 25, unless did somebody want to read it? If not, I'll do it. All right, I'm going to read it. Now, right off when he speaks, you'll notice he addresses this to the brethren, the brothers, the men of Israel. So again, he goes there to the synagogue. He's given the opportunity, as Sue was reading, to get up, which is normal. And he's going to address them. And what you're going to see is that God is seen in Paul's sermon as working through history in this early part uh, through the Jews, in other words, through uh, the nation of Israel to accomplish his purpose. And his purpose is going to be Jesus Christ. It's essentially what the first part is. Let me just read it. So Paul stood up and got the PowerPoint ready. No, no PowerPoint, guys. Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt 
and with an uplifted arm he led them out from it. For a period of about 40 years he put up with them in the wilderness. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. After these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for forty years. After he removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. From the descendants of this man, according to the promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and while John was completing his course, he kept saying, Why do you suppose, excuse me, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he, but behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Now we're going to go through this a little bit, and essentially what you're going to see is that God is seen as the one who is working. If you read through this on your own, you'll see that God is the one who is working in history through the nation of Israel to bring about his particular promise of fulfillment. And that shows us one thing. We need to know our Old Testaments, don't we? I'm going to give you this. This is not something I typically would, would do. I sometimes and maybe I do. I don't know if any of you ever struggle, and I don't want you to raise your hand because I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Have you ever struggled with sort of understanding the flow of the Old Testament? Sometimes people do. They, they, they don't understand the Old Testament or they struggle with parts of it or seeing it as one big unit. Sometimes I think the problem is that when we go to study, we study bits and pieces of it. How many of you know that people typically like to survey something and then go down into the details? That's what you should be doing. So, I'm going to make a suggestion to you. You don't have to use this. You may not need it. I would recommend to you to get a good, not a anything, survey of the Old Testament. Okay? This is. These are two different ones. They're basically the same. One just has really nice pictures and the other one doesn't. And I say this to you because they're not very long. This one would probably be the one that I would go with, unless you just really like pictures. <laughs> this one is illustrated, so it's, it's the same. But what it does is it gives you a survey, an overview of the Old Testament. It's sort of like, you know, if you get a survey of the land and you kind of have a basic grasp of what's going on, then you can go down into the details and fill them in. I think sometimes we don't do that. When uh, I went to Bible college, that was one of the things that we did. And, you know, even to this day, I still will read through one periodically just as a refresher. So I say that to you. If you struggle with it, if you don't, then don't worry about it. Then it's not a big deal. But uh, I do think it's helpful because what you'll notice here when I was reading it, what was Paul basically doing? Paul was basically going from Exodus to, we'll just say for argument's sake, the book of Mark or the Gospels. Do you notice? So look at it when he starts actually preaching. So he addresses them in verse 16. And he basically goes through the history where God works through Israel to prepare everything for Jesus. You have to remember, his focus is to get to Jesus, to explain Christ to them. And the way he uses is, of course, Exodus. Notice verses 17 through 18. And uh, I, I, I kind of get a chuckle out of one part of it. But you'll see where in verses 17 through 18, you see where it says, The God of this people chose our Father. So you see, God is the one who Paul sees as the one acting. He is the agent. He is the one who's fulfilling these things. And you'll notice that who led them in verse 17? Who led the nation of Israel out? Did Moses or was it God? Okay. Now, verse 18 makes me chuckle at the very end. He put up with them. He put up with them in the wilderness, right? He put up with them. And, of course, you see Exodus and Numbers, so you're in this sort of probably a little bit of Deut has some Deuteronomy aspects, but Exodus, Numbers. But then look at verse 19. Verse 19, you see where it says, When he, 
So when the Lord had destroyed and, of course, brought the people into the land, what book of the Bible is the book that shows them entering into the land? I can tell you it's not up through Deuteronomy. Joshua. You know, if you think about Joshua and we begin to get into the land. So if you think about what, just I want you to conceptualize what Paul's doing. He's saying, and I know he leaves off Genesis, he's basically going through the Pentateuch. He says, look, God was working through Exodus all the way through Deuteronomy to get his people that he has chosen into the promised land. When they get to the promised land, Joshua, of course, brings them in there. Uh, And then verse 20 shows us what? What did God do when they got into the land? Well, you have the book of Judges. You remember the book of Judges? It's a cycle. What happens with the people? Oh, Lord, save us. God saves them. They rejoice, and then they go back to sin. And then what happens? Oh, Lord, save us. (laughs) You know, wash and repeat. Have you ever heard that expression before? That would be the book of, and uh, of course. But you see where he does this. He says that there were judges until whom came. You see the transition, Samuel, right? And so you see where he moves into the book of 1 Samuel. So he's covered briefly Exodus through Deuteronomy for simplicity. He says, look at the book of Joshua and look what God was doing there. God even was with the people of Israel during the time of the judges until Samuel the prophet came. But then what happens in verse 21? What do the people want to do? Right, and you see where he's doing that here. And ultimately, who was it that got the king? Was it the people or did God? God gave them, Paul says, the king there, King Saul. Uh, And he describes there for... 40 years. So there you see he's moving through the book of 1 Samuel. But who removed Saul? Was it the people? Was it Samuel? Who removed him? Yeah, and you see it right there. You see what Paul's doing? He's focusing on that the Lord is the one doing all of this work and that the people weren't the ones that did it. God was the one doing it. Now imagine being a Jew and you're in that synagogue, and you've been all along studying and reading God's Word, and you have this man come in and say, God is the one who's been working through human history to do something. And we'll see what that something is in a second. So after he removed him, then you have this very important piece in what Paul's pointing to. Who comes after Saul? David. Okay, and what were some things about David that we saw that was important? Well, he, of course, was the son of Jesse and all of that, but he was a man after God's own heart and would do what he had asked him to do. Now, for Paul's purpose in this message, Paul wants the Jews to remember that God had promised David something, and what was that promise that he gave? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So you've got the Davidic covenant, all of those promises there. And you see, that's what he focuses on there. Now, notice what he does in verse 23. He says, From the descendants of this man, according to the promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. So we get there, so verses 16 through 22 is what Paul's baiting them with. He's baiting them with their own scripture. You know what I'm saying? He's saying, look, God has been working through human history to not only bring the people into the land, to fulfill what he's promised David. Now, if you're not familiar with that, that's 2 Samuel chapter 7, for instance, the Davidic covenant, and all of those promises with David. And what is important with David? God zeroes in and he narrows down and says the Messiah would come only through this line of David. And uh, so that's one of the things. I want us to turn just real quick, and uh, we'll go with the rest of the sermon. Turn with me to Psalm 132, and I'll read verse 11. Psalm 132, verse 11. And, of course, there are many. So, again, if you want to read the Davidic Covenant, one place you can go is Second Samuel chapter 7, as, as you all were referencing before, the, the idea there, uh, David and the Redeemer, had to, the Savior had to come through uh, 
the line of David, Psalm 132, verse 11. And this is one of many, and this isn't to say there aren't others. There's a lot about David in the Old Testament and the Messiah. Psalm 132, verse 11. The Lord has sworn to David a truth from which he will not turn back. Of the fruit of your body I will set, I will set upon your throne. In other words, if you see this in short, what it's saying there is that the Lord has made a promise to David. Does God ever break his promises? Does God ever not fill his promises? So obviously, rhetorically, he's going to fulfill the promise. He won't turn his back on the truth that he's given him, that one day the fruit of his body, in other words, the offspring, the seed of David, there would be one that would come and rule and reign forever. And God always keeps his promises, doesn't he? Always. Just as he said Jesus would come the first time, he's going to come the second time. And just as Jesus and so forth. So we have that idea there. So what you see here is that God has a plan for human history. Human history is not just revolving. It's not repeating itself. God has a plan, and it's centered on one thing, and it is Jesus Christ. And the goal of it, of course, I know there's a lot of pieces to that, But you see what Paul is saying. He says, look, God has been working through history of the nation of Israel to bring about the Savior and the Redeemer, and that is Jesus. And so he points to that. But he also promised in the Old Testament there would be one who would come and proclaim his way. Do you see what Paul does? He's connecting the dots. So you have Malachi, the... 400 years of silence, which if you know me, I don't like that phrase because it makes it seem as though God was not working. What that means is God did not provide us any divine revelation from Malachi until when? Right, or Mark, whichever way you want to say it. But what did God promise in the Old Testament? He said that there would be someone who would come and herald forward that the Messiah had come. And you see that if you look at verses 24 and 25. So he's already pointed them to that Jesus was the Savior according to the promise. And when God makes a promise, he's going to fulfill it. But notice in verses 24 and 25, after John had proclaimed before his coming, did John proclaim that Jesus was coming before or after? Well, obviously before. He's called the forerunner, right? Mm -hmm. And so you see where Paul just beautifully is weaving all of this together. And he, of course, called them to a baptism of repentance to all people of Israel. And, of course, we saw that when we started studying Mark chapter 1. Uh, Wanda was talking about that. Mark chapter 1 is a really good connector of the dots because what happens? Mark just starts right at Jesus' ministry, which is the forerunner, and that's John the Baptist. So you've got Paul going through the Old Testament, and then when God's time is to begin speaking divinely, The Baptist, John the Baptist, comes on the scene. But one of the things that I think is interesting about John is John didn't attract people to himself. He always wanted to point others to Jesus. And you actually see where Paul makes that, and we'll finish with this. Verse 25, and it says, And while John was completing his course, he kept saying, Why do you suppose that that I am? I am not he, but behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. John was pretty content with what the Lord gave him to do, wasn't he? Did you ever notice that about John the Baptist? I've always appreciated that, that he was content with what God had given him to do, and he made sure that he did not so much attract people to himself. Of course, he did have people that is, but he pointed others to Jesus. And I always think of, in terms of ministry and service, Who should we be pointing others to? I mean, that's what John does. I mean, John points that. And I'm not saying that his disciples didn't stay with him and weren't faithful to him. But in the course of time, what did they ultimately do? Most of them went and they followed the Lord Jesus. And I think John prepared them well because he was content with what God had given him to do. And you and I need to do the same. God has given each one of you, just like me, a particular ministry to do. And we need to be content with it and just finish what he's given us to do. Now, in just a few minutes, I, I deliberately let, tried to leave some time for questions or comments. Uh, 
We'll look at the second and third part, in other words, the rest of Paul's sermon next week. But um, before, if you have any comments or anything, I'll just, just three things for us to consider when we leave. Uh, we should strive to reconcile with others as best we can. I think that's probably the best way to say it biblically. We should strive to reconcile with others as best we can. Uh, hopefully it will happen, but there may be cases when, unfortunately, that doesn't work. The other was, even when we fall short, the Lord can still use us. Amen? And then finally, God's Word reveals to us God's plan for history, but how it's centered in Jesus Christ. Uh, and Jesus is the center of everything. And that's the message that Paul was bringing there. And we'll see more on that uh, next week. But I was trying to leave some time in case anybody had any questions or just general comments.